Hi, I'm Kathy Bush Dutton, the publisher of New England Home. And on behalf of our entire team, I guess I'm gonna need my glasses. We're beyond excited to introduce you to the incredibly super talented women who are the 2020 class of five under 40 winners. We never fail to be amazed at the wealth of young design talent that emerges year after year here in New England. 11 years ago, the 540 awards were specifically developed to recognize rising exceptional New England residential design stars in architecture, interior design, specialty design, and landscape design. Basically, we set out to find the hottest young design professionals in New England. Since our event is quite different this year, as we had to postpone our in-person award celebration until the fall of 2021, we're giving the floor today to our five award winners so they can introduce themselves and share their work as well as their design philosophy. In addition, as a special thanks to those of you tuned in today, we're granting you early access to the online auction of each of the winners custom one of a kind rugs that they've designed. The rug auction proceeds benefit the charity Barricat located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which helps educate children and women in Southeast Asia where the rugs are actually handmade with the help of Landry and Akari. Basically, we come full circle. The rugs are made in Southeast Asia and the auction money all goes back to help educate women and children in that part of the world. I cannot thank Landry and Akari enough for being our 540 partner and helping us to conceive the 540 awards and of course, custom producing each of the winner's rugs. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to my partner at New England Home, our Editor-in-Chief, Jenna Talbot. Jenna? Hi, thank you, Kathy. Ooh, it's getting dark in my room here. <laughs> just my light here. I would like to extend my own congratulations to our winners. Thank you everyone for joining us as well. I'm truly impressed and truly honored to be a part of this highly respected awards program this year. And I have enjoyed getting to know these five over the last few weeks. This year's five under 40 winners include three Boston-based interior designers, an architect in Portland, Maine, and a landscape architect practicing in Connecticut. We actually were able to meet in person, one at a time, at our five under 40 photo shoot at Landry and Arkari last month, and it was wonderful to speak with each of them. I think as you hear from our winners today, you'll understand why they were selected by our judges. Not only that, but the work they're sharing with us tonight is a true visual feast. We've given each of them five minutes to share five images from their portfolios. The plan is to get through all five in 25 minutes. This should give us time to take some questions at the end. And some of you have submitted questions already and we'll be watching the chat and Q&A windows if others would like to submit during our program. And we'll just get through as many as we can. And now I'll introduce our first five under 40 class of 2020 winner interior designer, Stephanie King. And Stephanie King is the lead designer at Heather Wells here in Boston. She received her BFA in interior design from Syracuse University in 2007 and has worked for such high-end residential design firms as Amy Lau Design in New York City and Slifer Designs in Edwards, Colorado. Stephanie has a delightful and accurate way of describing interior design as art that you live in. Her designs often begin with a distinctive color palette specific to each client, which she then layers with texture, form, and decidedly bespoke influences. Congratulations, Stephanie. And let's hear from Stephanie now. Hi, Jenna, thank you so much. Um, like Jenna said, I'm Stephanie King and I'm the lead designer at Heather Wells. At Heather Wells, I believe in our firm's philosophy that no two projects are alike and all designs are client-driven, as, you, as you'll see throughout my portfolio. Within the company, I pride myself as being the creative force behind many of our projects where I'm able to design a space that is unique in its vision and execution. I strongly believe that art and function can live in harmony, resulting in a space that showcases the client's personality through a curated space highlighted by its bespoke and crafted interiors. For this project, it's an Upper East Side penthouse with a unique assignment, an adult daughter and her retired parents based in the Midwest asked us to create a pied-a-terre in New York to entertain it. I enjoyed the challenge of designing a mixed purpose space that appeals with three generations and functional for all of them. Luckily, the mother and daughter were on the same page in regards to the design approach. They shared a love for antique rugs, soft femi but feminine colors and tailored furniture. 
They wanted the penthouse to be elegant and cosmopolitan with less details. We took developer finished this developer finished penthouse unit and add layers of architectural molding, rich lacquered panels, and other pre-war touches to make this resemble a more classic New York apartment. I loved pairing traditional concepts with, and colors with modern finishes. Again, a great example of this would be the abstracted floral hand-painted wallpaper in this entry by Porter Tilio. Um, next image. Uh, this is the same apartment and in this, in this uh, photo of this bar, you'll see with the living room in the background, you can see two of the most beautiful antique rugs that were the driving force for this design. I love how this traditional element was the foundation for the beautiful modern textures and accents like the, wall, the glittery wallpaper and the David Weissman cut crystal pendants above the table. Next slide. For this Boston penthouse, one of my favorite aspects was collaborating with both artisans to create the perfect gallery backdrop for the client, who, was also, who also acted as the project architect and hired our firm to collaborate on her new venture. This space was sculpted to complement the client's significant art collection, creating a core gallery space made of rich walnut veneers surrounded by layers of shikui Japanese plaster found throughout the apartment. I selected bespoke furniture, fabrics, lighting accessories that complemented the architectural envelope and the muted color palette was carefully selected to harmonize with the client's extensive art collection, as you can see here in this beautiful living room. What I love most about this apartment is the rich layer of interior finishes, including the cast glass doors, bronze buckouts, and 17 inch wide oak floors from Denmark. The pairing of these sophisticated finishes with the soft interior is a, interior is a great example of how every interior we create feels different and unique for each client. Next slide. Uh, located in the Yellowstone Club in Big Sky, Montana, the clients are, these are our clients decided to design their third home with us. This project was unique in the sense that with the earned trust from past projects, it allowed the clients to only make a few requests at the start of the project. But once the groundwork, groundwork was set, I was able to run with the design concept freely. The design was a true interpretation of the clients of the client through my design lens. Another interesting challenge was collaborating across state lines. Our design team located in Boston worked closely with architect Reed Smith based in Montana and with the clients residing in California. I loved learning about the Montana landscape and collab collaborating with local artisans to create finish a finished palette that paid respect to its sense of place. A great example of this, of this is the natural stone cladding found throughout the home, concrete, this concrete island and steel details throughout. The clients were looking for the ultimate mountain party getaway. I think I was able to accomplish this through a modern design paired with use of natural finishes, dynamic furnishings, and color palette. Um, next slide. Finally, this has always been one of my favorite projects. Its simplicity feels like a wonderful counterbalance to our more complex projects. The house is a classic Cape Cod, Cape Cod waterfront estate where the original woodwork and walls were revived with coats of flat white paint to evoke a modern simplicity and complement a family significant art collection. Working in close collaboration with the client, I created an airy yet intimate space, space with Belgian influenced interiors. Neutral tones carry throughout with black and white minimalist furniture. These super cool marine rope rocking chairs, woven pendant and paper rug are a great example of this simplistic design. Collaborating with Del Mitchell architects, every detail refined or rustic was purposeful. From the white oak wide plank floors to the custom made Belgian hardware. To create a casual, cool atmosphere, we embraced the existing quirks and roughness to enhance the newly added finishes of the house. As designers, we are accustomed to expecting perfection, but for this project, I embraced the Japanese tradition of wabi-sabi, embracing the art of imperfection to create an, an effortlessly cool interior. Done. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. And I think you were just a touch over five minutes. Thanks. Perfect. It's always hard to go first. Well, thank you so much, You're Stephanie. Thank you so much. <laughs> and next up, we have this year's winner in architecture, Jesse Carroll, who is the associate principal with Witten Architects in Portland, Maine. Jessie completed her master's in architecture in 2010 from Northeastern University. She's a licensed architect in Maine and Massachusetts, and her professional experience includes internships at Chan, Krieger, and Sinowitz, as well as Canon Design and UTL Incorporated, where she was an architectural designer. 
Jesse also served as project manager at Broadwick Building and Remodeling in Falmouth, Massachusetts, where she managed the construction of seven custom homes in Cape Cod. Jesse's greatest strength is a uniquely empathetic design approach where she prioritizes her relationships with clients and builders and celebrates collaboration. Congratulations, Jesse. Great, thank you so much, Jenna. Um, so this award has given me the opportunity to reflect on my 12 years of practice and the body of work that's been produced. And the question of personal style came up and I think that's a really interesting one. And style has almost become a dirty word in our office at Witten Architects. Uh, we don't seek modern architecture or traditional architecture. What we're hoping to do is produce body of work that acknowledges the site and takes cues from the beautiful landscape of New England and where our clients are truly listened to and um, their personalities hopefully are reflected in the outcome of the work. Uh, and I think that produces a portfolio of varied projects, uh, a few of which we'll look at here. And I think the consistency you see across all the projects is a rigor within the detail and a simplicity of form and an attention to proportion um, and, and a real careful consideration. And so this first image is a project in Southern Maine that's quite simple. We're looking at a garage uh, through a porch. Um, the landscape architect being Soren Denord and builder being Bally Builders. Um, I think this is a great example of showing how beautiful and elegant a garage can be and how rigorous the detail you can see um, in the porch assembly and the trellis. Uh, what I remember most about this project is standing on the porch with the framer and he's saying, you know, I never thought to frame it this way, but the outcome's pretty slick. And he was referring to kind of the port ceiling and the edge condition. And we can go to the next slide. So this is the same project, an image in the stairwell and a client pointed this out to me. I do geek out on stair detailing and it's the opportunity to really cut a vertical slice through a building and bring light in and kind of flex that architectural muscle. And I think this is a beautiful example of that where you can see the rigor in detailing of the nickel gap on the walls um, and how it meets the trim at the large window openings. Um, there's a skylight above, a bit out of frame here, um, and a lot of detail structural work that goes into these open risers that bring light to the stairs below, um, and the glass handrail, which is barely visible here, but all of which uh, there's a lot of thinking and planning going into such a small space. Um, and I think we know we're succeeding when in the end it looks quite simple. Can go to the next slide. So here's another project in Mid Coast, Maine. Um, two of our favorite clients are in the image. And I think what's wonderful about this space, again, is allowing the architecture to be simple and the details of the millwork to be mute. Um, here's a hardworking kitchen, but you know, everything is tidy and clean, kept behind sort of minimal detailing of millwork. Next slide. Here's the other end of that space and, you know, allowing the architecture here to take the back seat to the coastal landscape here in Maine and really focusing the inhabitant to look out and um, here, you know, use of large windows, really simple detailing uh, at the ceiling, keeping the palette mute and putting the landscape first. Next slide. Um, here's another project, uh, this one recently photographed in Southern Maine. Um, this is a personal home for a builder, which was a huge honor, a uh, builder that we work with often to work with him and his young family. Um, and here you're seeing beautiful landscape 
and uh, simple forms and a rigor and detail and execution uh, to pull off sort of big glass, big openings, uh, scribing wood to stone. Um, next slide. Uh, this is another image of the same home, uh, the last and final image. And again, I think there is a lot of thought and work that goes into pulling off um, a home such as this with big glass, a lot of steel and wood detailing that hopefully goes unnoticed. And the result it is truly elegant and one that sits in the landscape gently um, and is really an enjoyable space for a young family. That's all I've got. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Now I told everybody this was a visual feast. I think this is this is wonderful. And there's three more to go. So now I'd like to introduce you to interior designer Alina Woolhart, principal and founder of Wolf and Sheep Design here in Boston. Alina received her Bachelor of Arts in Interior Design from the New England School of Art and Design in 2008. Her work experience includes stints at two well-known Boston firms, Elkis Manfredi Architects and Duncan Hughes Interiors. Alina brings a decidedly global perspective to her work. She grew up in both Tokyo and Copenhagen, and this influence is exhibited in her attention to detail and emphasis on comfort. As she says of living in Denmark, comfort is really valued because the winter months are long and dark. Congratulations, Alina. Thank you, Jenna, um, and thank you, New England Home, for this amazing honor. And, you know, I started my firm um, five years ago now, and I just want to say, like, I couldn't do what we do today um, without my amazing team who inspire me, like, every day and who is a tre tremendous part of um, my company. And also to the amazing um, tradesmen and manufacturers and vendors that we work with. Um, you know, it's definitely teamwork to create these beautiful projects. So I'm very grateful for everyone that we can collaborate with. Uh, so this first slide um, is a project that we designed in Bay Village. Um, this is, uh, we actually, a client is a, a young woman who came to us that needed help um, rearranging her overall flow of the space. Um, the overall space felt very dark. So we were involved when doing the um, interior space plan of the space, but also in the process, we wanted to bring, you know, ref bring something that reflected her personality, which was this beautiful, like bright young woman. So we believe when creating, when we're creating spaces that it's of course our um, work to bring our clients' visions to life, but it's also our job to you know push the boundaries and suggest ideas that they necess didn't necessarily think of. So in this case, um, she came to us like looking for actually a neutral um, palette kitchen, but um, we sort of went the other way and. Um, we went for this bold blue um, bright kitchen, which brought so much life and energy into the space. And um, she's, you know, she couldn't be happier with the space. So um, it also shows you that you cannot um, get shy from bright colors and you can just, you know, just need to go bigger, go home sometimes. Next slide. Um, so this is another example of how you can use bright, bold colors in a space. Um, this was a project in Chestnut Hill. Uh, this was for actually an older gentleman that we worked with. Um, and when designing spaces, we are definitely mindful of um, our clients' needs and also like ergonomics. So he was actually quite tall. So we designed this vanity to be um, a custom height that matched his height um, and also you know when designing bathrooms we're mindful of like how they can age in the space so when we design this bathroom there's actually like blocking in the walls um, for future grab bars 
um, you know, stuff that you don't see in this picture, but all these details are thought um, when creating the spaces. Next slide. This is a project um, in Rose Wharf, Boston, um, right on the water. Um, this was for a single man that came to us that needed an overall like full design vision. Um, this was one of my favorite projects to work on. Um, when we first started, this unit was, you know, designed um, back in the late 80s. There were wood paneling, moldings everywhere, gold leaf ceilings. Um, it was quite dated. So we, you know, what actually started off with um, some like temporary furniture project, it sort of turned into life on its own and became a full gut renovations where everything was brought down to the studs. Um, and in this picture, you know, you see a closet on the left side of the space, which was custom built and brought from Italy. And we spec'd all these custom doors from Italy's as well. Um, and the baseboard was designed and the, when we were designing this space, we had to rework the whole floor plan. Um, next slide. So this is the same project. Um, so this is the view of the kitchen. Uh, initially, this was a galley kitchen and to the left of it, there's actually also water view um, that you couldn't enjoy before. So we opened up the wall um, created a nice open feeling into the living room so that the living room and the kitchen felt more connected, which is what people tend to look for these days. Um, and also like when designing kitchens, we have to be mindful of our clientele. So in this particular case, he was a single man, he didn't cook. So he was certain that he wanted white marble um, and, you know, as some of you may know, it stains very easily and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Well, I was actually wouldn't recommend it to a family um, or someone that cooks often, but um, he was adamant that he wasn't going to cook. So I was lucky enough to be able to spec this beautiful white marble um, for the kitchen island. Next slide. So uh, this is... Uh, a place in the South End that we designed for a young couple. Um, they had this smaller guest bedroom that was never in use. They just had a little futon in there. Um, so they said they wanted to have a room where they could actually um, hang out on their own or have some friends over for drinks. So we, um, for a small space, I actually believe going dark can be actually more cozy and um, actually more welcoming. So this is a really small room, but we went with dark gray walls, um, black wallpaper on the ceiling, and then jewel tone fabrics for the furniture. Um, so when, you know, you're feeling a little afraid of dark colors. You don't have to be. I love darkness. Um, and I think what brings this room so much character is the collection of antique items that we were able to source um, through Brimfield and actually reusing some of her um, heirlooms from her grandmother. So this is sort of a little project of passion where it took quite a long time to curate the space, but you can actually tell how much there's a lot of layers into this small little room. And that's it. Great, thank you, Alina. Uh, I actually really love that um, last project and not because I'm sitting in a small dark room myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> So our winner in the landscape architecture category is Elizabeth Hendrickson, senior landscape architect at Catherine Herman Design in New Canaan, Connecticut. Elizabeth credits her upbringing on her grandparents' organic farm in New Jersey with fostering her love of plants. 
Elizabeth completed her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Landscape Architecture at Rutgers University in 2006, and she is a registered landscape architect in New York State and Connecticut. She worked as a landscape designer for firms from Maine to New Jersey, as well as LeBlanc Jones Landscape Architecture in Boston before joining Catherine Herman in 2011. Elizabeth aims to create landscapes that blend seamlessly with the surrounding architecture and feel as if they've always been there. Congratulations, Elizabeth. Thank you, Jenna. This award is truly an honor and I'm so grateful to be recognized. So, sorry. So grateful to be recognized for doing something I genuinely love. As Jenna mentioned, I'm senior associate at Catherine Herman Design, where I've worked for over nine and a half years and have had the opportunity to work on an incredible variety of projects. Through this award process, I have been asked several times to describe my style of design. However, I've realized that I don't actually design with one style in mind because it is my job to complement the architecture of each project and create a landscape that appears as if it was always there. Every home and every site is different and every client has their own unique program and wish list for their garden. When every project is a different style, a new challenge is always presented and the creative solutions endless. And the following images are examples of five different projects of varying styles in which plants and hard state materials are used strategically to blend the constructed elements into the surrounding site. This first project is located in Greenwich, Connecticut. A contemporary home designed by Amanda Martokio Architects is truly integrated with the site. The reflective windows mirror the surrounding woodland, creating the illusion of a transparent structure. The pool with built-in spa is nestled between the very prominent existing rock outcrops in the rear yard. Locally sourced materials are used for the hardscape. Bluestone is used for the pool terrace and a fieldstone wall stacked in gabion baskets is used for the retaining wall that stretches between the exposed ledge. Plantings of small trees and shrubs in varying shades of green provide layers of color and texture, while several types of ornamental grasses and perennials add a touch of whimsy, blending the built environment into the surrounding wooded site. Next, please. This project is also located in Greenwich, Connecticut. Situated on the water, this home is in the French style and the landscape truly complements the architecture. We were tasked with renovating an existing landscape and used the opportunity to create hedged garden rooms, a formal lawn, incorporate topiary, wildflower meadows, and wisteria vines into the design. This image shows a gravel seating area under pollarded London plane trees with white roses lining the space. The view beyond of the lawn steps and sloping meadow leads to the formal lawn at the back of the house. Meadows are planted with seasonal bulbs and a wide variety of flowers, providing interest throughout the season, as well as habitat for migrant birds and pollinators. Next, please. This may be one of my favorite spaces, and I get so excited when I visit this property and get to see what's blooming and feel the embrace of the surrounding landscape at the rear of this guest house. This home is located in Westchester County, New York, and was designed by Peter Penoyer Architects. This five acre site has an abundance of beautiful rock outcrops and native woods, all of which served as inspiration for this landscape design. This rear terrace was designed knowing we would have very limited access when this project was completed. So we created a space in which a lawnmower would never be needed. Per our client's program, included in this rear space are a large dining table for gatherings and parties, a fire pit with casual seating, as well as a checker and chessboard. The large stone terrace transitions from a solid paving pattern with tight sand swept joints to a looser pattern with gravel joints of varying sizes. Catmint, creeping phlox, and mazes are randomly planted to break up the paved area as well. Boulders interrupt the curved antique stone steps that embrace the entire area. A perennial border provides color, depth, and texture, and is backed by lush evergreen screening trees. Imported boulders are used to retain the steeply sloping hillside with creeping flocks and lambs here planted between them. Next. Sorry, I said next. <laughs> Moving to an entirely different style. This Mediterranean home in Darien, Connecticut, designed by Vincente Buren Architects, is perched on a hill with sloping lawns and mature trees surrounding it. We were tasked with creating outdoor living spaces that serve a variety of functions, from everyday dining, lounging, and gathering, to the occasional tented wedding. 
The spaces of the courtyard are organized using brick inlays, lawn panels, and brick terraces. The custom furnishings and planters provide function and flexibility for a family that entertains frequently. Large palms create height and variety with, while glow boxwoods punctuate the custom designed backless benches, which serve to separate the lounge area from the paths to the additional outdoor garden rooms. An antique wellhead and water feature flank a space with additional planters full of seasonal blooms. Next, please. Lastly, this traditional home in Scarsdale, New York, designed by Alice Burke Parker Architects, is owned by clients that love plants. Plants are, in fact, one of my favorite things, and this project provided me the opportunity to play with flowers. This pool area was transformed when the renovated Bluestone Terrace was reduced in size to minimize the amount of pavement near the pool, while still providing enough space for the client's existing furniture. Grass joints separate the paving stones in areas where only paths are needed. A palette of purples, blues, and whites, my personal favorite, create layers of flowering perennials surrounding the pool, providing a lush and almost secret garden space. Varieties of salvia are mixed with white astilbe, catmint, ladies' mantle, and other perennials that bloom later in the season. The swooping hornbeam hedge separates the pool area from the rear yard, while large mock orange flank the door to the home. And that's that. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I'd like to point out the plants behind Elizabeth, <laughs> which I think are really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and I hope everyone's being is able to see these nice and large. Um, they're very minimized on my screen, though I've seen them before. These, these are really beautiful, beautiful projects that we're seeing today. So last, but most certainly not least, I'm pleased to introduce interior designer Emily Penny, who is principal and founder of Penny Designs in Belmont, Massachusetts, and owner of Sid and Sam, a home decor and custom furniture boutique in Cambridge. Emily received her Bachelor of Arts in Interior Design from Boston Architectural College in 2008. She also studied furniture and lighting design in Florence, Italy via the study abroad program at Fairfield University. Emily comes from an entrepreneurial family. Her father had a design build firm in New Hampshire and as a child, she spent hours on job sites and in his workshop. Today, Emily is known not only for her talent as a designer, but as a mentor to younger designers. Fostering emerging talent is important to her as is giving back to the community that nurtured her. Congratulations, Emily. Thank you, Jenna. That was really nice. Um, I'm so happy to be here and being a part of this amazing group of women. It's so fun that it's all women this year. I know it's happened a few times, but I'm glad it's happened this time as well. Um, in my career as a designer, my clients have always really loved my practical and pragmatic aesthetic and the way I approach projects and become part of the team. I have always said that if I wasn't uh, a residential interior designer that I would have liked to design the interiors of boats. I really like the way that everything has to be thoroughly thought out. There's more than one function for everything and I, I just love that. I think a lot of ways that's similar to kitchens. Um, this is a kitchen that I designed in Warren, Vermont a few years ago. Um, and this kitchen, everything was built into the islands because there's, you'll see in a minute, but there's really amazing views um, off the frame to the right. And so as you're approaching the house from the driveway to the left, it's all glass. And so the clients really wanted to carry and be able to see through the glass windows and at the view to the right. Um, the other thing that we did here, instead of having a big sink and a prep sink, we did two large working sinks, not to limit um, our clients with where they needed to do their work, but also allowing it to function for more than one person at a time. Next slide. So this is the view that you can see and you can understand why the clients didn't want to block this um, with, a with your typical kitchen. Um, this chandelier is a really fun piece for me. I think as designers, we're very often looking for something that's gonna make a nice statement, something that's big and bold. But in this case, we really wanted it to disappear. You can tell that if we had an iron chandelier here, it would really block that view and be right at the crest of that mountain. Um, this is a really fun fixture from your European brand named Quadar, and it has 70 little bulbs on it. And I think it really complements the landscape beyond with, you know, kind of looking like a galaxy at night, but really letting you look through it. Um, 
next slide. This is one of my favorite rooms that we've done and uh, most of Pinterest. I can't tell you how many times it's been blogged on, pinned, and we get questions all the time in the office about it. And I think there's something that just everyone really um, can resonate with this space and they wanna be in this space. And I think a lot of that is the coziness, even though it's in a pretty big space and a high vaulted space, I think, a lot of the coziness comes from the properly scaled furnishings, you know, the rug that's the right size, the, you know, the combination of the wool and silk in the rug, but then also working with the colors of the landscape. So you can see in those drapes, we don't have a lot of fabric in this room, but those draperies have all the colors of the landscapes. They have the sand and the green and the grass from the dune. They have the blues of the ocean, just bringing it all inside and blurring that line between the inside and outside. Um, I also love um, playing off and, but not, um, not taking away from the architecture. So keeping things minimal so the architecture can really show through is important to me as a designer. Next slide. This is another one where I would say, you know, trying to add to the architecture and not taking away from the architecture. So this is in the same house. We're using those same colors from the landscape, the dune behind, you can see kind of in the middle of those windows where they come together and the ocean beyond. So using a lot of those colors, but also the clients were looking for privacy. Um, and warmth. So we use these motorized woven shades so that when they're up, you can really take in the view, the shades become part of the architecture and they're not some really heavy fabric up there and it lets the light come through. But when they're down, the clients can get the privacy that they need. Um, I also really love to add something interesting to a space um, and maybe a talking point or something sculptural or an antique. And the chair here in the foreground, the rocking chair is a, vintage chair, it's a, a Hans Wagner, and we bought it from a antique vendor in Paris for this project, so that was really fun. Um, and then next slide, it's my last slide. So something, I this was the project that was really um, special for me, it was last summer, uh, we partnered with the Room to Dream Foundation. So the Room to Dream Foundation is a nonprofit here in Boston, and they work with children's hospitals, and they, um, they renovate rooms of chronically ill children. And this was something that I've always wanted to do, and I think a great way to give back and give our time and our talent. Um, so this was not just me, it was my entire office pulling this off. We did it in one weekend, so we obviously designed it, had everything ordered. Ryan is the little boy in the photo on the right. Um, and he wanted a pizza room, <laughs> not his mother's choice. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but uh, the wallpaper is actually pizza wallpaper. We found the print um, from a designer in Europe and asked him for uh, the file of it and had it printed here in Boston. Um, and so we designed his room, his, his siblings rooms and also their um, their basement, which I'm told it was the biggest one weekend makeover that Room to Dream had ever done. I really hope that we can do more of these um, post COVID. I think it's a really amazing way to be able to give back to our community. I think any designer that was on the, our speaking panel tonight would tell you that we are always designing our spaces for the enjoyment and elevating the interior environment of our clients' homes, which is a really great and fun thing to do, but to be able to help chronically Ill, Ill children and help them feel happy in their space and enjoy their space and not be stuck at home in a space that they're not loving is really important to me. That's it. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Uh, designers can do anything. Pizza, wallpaper. <laughs> that was wonderful. And you all spoke about your work so well. I think that is um, an absolute uh, skill set as well as, as creating the work, as being able to, to share and, and talk about it in this way. So we have a, a, a little bit of time left. Um, we're going to get to some questions. A couple came in, which I'm keeping an eye on, but we did have some that were submitted ahead of time. And by far, um, 
the, the most popular question, um, it's very timely, it's how have you managed to remain inspired and creative in quarantine conditions? And do you have any advice to share that may help those of us struggling behind a screen and not out in the world? So who would like to go first on that? I can speak to it. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been really, really fortunate to be so busy during the entire pandemic, which initially came as a bit of a surprise. We didn't know exactly what to expect. And um, we just stayed really busy and had great clients along the way. And so the inspiration that we're gathering is, is almost as if, you know, the inspiration we would always be getting from um, imagery and past projects and um, traveling that we've done in the past. I mean, we always gather loads and loads of imagery when we start to begin a project. And obviously for our, our uh, field, the um, architecture and the site that we're designing in are so prominent in, in how we design space um, or a landscape. And like I said, it's just, while the only real change for us is we've been working remotely a lot, um, we've gone back 50% to the office, but um, clients, we've done, we've done presentations virtually and um, that's actually worked out really well. Um, although sometimes it's like talking into a vacuum. Um, but um, for the most part, we've been so, so fortunate to continue to do what we do um, with really great clients through all of this. The program has changed, but um, our work still goes on. That's for we sure. carry on. That's great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Stephanie, did you want to answer that one? I look like you might oh, have something to say. Sure. <laughs> well, I, um, I agree, like our, we have not slowed down, we're equally as busy. I think um, <clears throat> being in this atmosphere, I think a lot has to do with how important home is right now to everybody and really investing their time into their home. Um, a few things early on during um, when we had stay at home orders, I found were really interesting um, for inspiration. Once people kind of worked out the kinks of Zoom, um, there were a lot of like home tours of very famous designers that I would go into and, and follow. And even if it was in the background, just seeing these other people's people opened up their homes, these you know beautiful designers or artists, they shared their homes. Um, and you could see how they think and what they collect and all this beautiful textural interior that you may normally not get to see other than in the pages of a magazine. And I thought it was just so interesting because you got to see it and it was more um, true to them because it wasn't perfectly manicured and it didn't have every, you know, you got to see every single flower in place, but you, you got to see how they really lived. And I thought that was a really intimate view um, into people's homes and a great inspiration um, to future projects. And just, just in general, just inspiration for the time that we're in at the moment. Um, I mean, on top of that, I mean, Instagram and anything, you know, I've just really upped my game on following artists and designers that I absolutely love and furniture makers and things like that and really trying to go further into their work rather than just looking at it quickly like say really saving things and going back and looking at them thoroughly and taking them in um, because we have a little bit more time not commuting and things like that so just taking the little bit of extra time that we do have to use and um, use it to inspire myself and clients and client design. That's great. And I think Instagram has been a kind of a lifesaver and a lifeline uh, for many of us, uh, which was a kind of a question down the line too, um, is, is if there's particular avenue of social media um, that, you, that any of you um, use to help expand your brand. Um, I don't wanna assume that's Instagram, but I feel like that's, that's a pretty great tool for people these days. And if anyone else wants to respond to how, do, how you're staying creative these days too, I, um, uh, hop right in. I mean, I think it's hard to stay, um, to keep your creative juices flowing when there is just so much happening in the world right now. You know, um, I think everyone's really tired um, just going through what we're, what we're all going through. Everyone has their story of, you know, like, 2020 definitely has been one hell of a year. Um, and I think, you know, at first I was 
sort of being, you know, I felt like I was being hard on myself for like not being able to focus. Like, I don't feel like I can focus um, like I was able to before, but there's so many distractions. Um, and so what I was trying to focus on is that it's okay. You know, if it doesn't come to you right away, like it did before, it's okay. Like you can't, I think, you know, being a creative person or like working on these creative things, um, you can't force it sometimes, you know, it comes to you when it comes to you. And um, I think our clients have been extremely understanding um, and we feel very fortunate that we were able to stay busy and we feel very lucky that, you know, it was almost a distraction to what was happening um, in the world that we were able to work on these like beautiful things. Um, but I think, you know, when, if any of anyone is feeling like they can't focus and they can't, they're not feeling creative, I think what we need to sort of say to ourselves is that it's okay and be a little kinder, you know, to yourselves and each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially as, as creatives. I mean, the process comes from where the process comes and sometimes that changes. Yes. Yeah. Jesse, did you yeah. want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to echo um, that sentiment because I, I do totally hear you and feel similarly when that next design move or idea is just not coming to you and you are killing endless paper. It's often the next best move to step away. Um, from the drawing board and let kind of your brain do its thing and come to a solution organically on its own time. I, I often find that next best move is often walking away. Um, and no doubt this is an, an incredibly challenging time. Uh, it's hard to be away from our teams and hard to be away from the people that we are used to collaborating with so often. Um, but I would say uh, for myself, a, a real energy boost for me is getting onto a job site and seeing work in place. Um, we'll spend a, a year behind a computer designing at our office with our clients and with our team and going to see the fruits of the labor in place and in motion uh, reminds you that you will get there and uh, can be really exciting. Um, and really rejuvenating um, part of COVID times. Absolutely, I agree. I think just the times together when we do get out are so precious, they can be completely energizing. <laughs> I found that for myself. Emily, do you wanna add anything to that or? Yeah, I mean, I think just what everyone said, I mean, it's so hard to, I feel like all I'm doing is working. You know, I have two young kids and it's, it's I, I've had a very hard time to stop working, stop answering emails and enjoying time with them. And I, I've been just shutting it off on the weekends and my husband and I go hiking and put the, put my parents with my kids. But I find that I, a lot comes to me when I'm just out and away from the computer. So we've been hiking a lot and I get a lot of ideas while I'm doing something outside of where I think I would find it. Obviously Instagram a ton, but I think it's just important to be be kind to yourself. And if you are struggling, just being behind a computer, getting away from it is probably the best thing to do. <laughs> that's I, absolutely I true. That's a beautiful sentiment um, that you added, Alina and everybody else, just because it is true. Like as much as you can still be, we're all talking about how busy we are. I think that is very true. Like I have two children too. You know, we're all like, this is hard for everybody. So as much as like things are can be wonderful job wise that we're busy. There still is the reality of what's going on. I appreciate you saying that. Well, stepping away is an interesting tactic too, and that does lead into one question that that um, was asked uh, prior to today. Um, if anyone ha does anyone have a favorite or frequent book that's not online, it's not an internet source that you find yourself referring to for designs for it could be anything. I, at least it didn't say that, but I think it could be anything. Anything that you pick up. There's a book called Dark Nostalgia um, that I love. And actually, um, when I was working with Duncan at Duncan Hughes Interiors, um, we sort of started obsessing um, over this book. And I think that's sort of like where my love for 
dark interiors um, come into place, but this is a book of all these like dark rooms and how cozy and how sexy and how amazing it can be. So, you know, I try to show clients um, that you don't have to be afraid of dark colors and the darkness. <laughs> I just wrote that down. I love it. <laughs> Anybody, else? <laughs> Anybody else have a book they want to mention? Jesse? Yeah, I could add um, when I started at Witten Architects seven years ago, the founding principal put a book on my desk that's um, Venki Selmer's book, Norwegian Wood. And he said, you are going to love this. And it's an architect, female architect who is well beyond her years, who just created these incredibly organic spaces that are incredibly well done. <laughs> and uh, there's images of her drafting outside under an umbrella with a small child nearby. And she just seemed so so of her ahead of her time and the work is incredible and that is a book that he was spot on truly inspiring can you say the name of that book again it's norwegian wood Norwegian somewhere excellent i hope i'm remembering that correctly i have been a while since i've been to the office and i think it's out of print so i don't know how helpful okay. that is google will help us yes. we, have a, we have an interesting uh, question that re relates to all of this um, and kind of what we're talking about and finding inspiration. Um, the question is, uh, what is one place that you traveled pre-COVID, which I think a lot of people are looking back on like their memories and their photos and whatever, um, that you draw inspiration from a place that you might've been? Anyone? I know this is a new one. You didn't get to view this one before, <laughs> mm -hmm. before we started. <laughs> Well, you mentioned in my intro that I studied in Florence um, mm -hmm. and I've been back many times since. I just find that the architecture there and the colors of the landscape and the buildings, just I find that very a very inspiring place. I love going to the museums and um, going to the restaurants and just walking around the town and the city and um, soaking it all in. I mean, I, I can't wait to go back. Yes, the history for sure too. I studied in Florence as well, yeah. Anybody else? Um, I'm, I'm a total plant nerd. And so I don't need to go too far to find like a really gorgeous garden um, and uh, an arboretum or even, even a golf course. It's a landscape, right? <laughs> but, um, so for me, I'm always, always ever constantly like looking at, at plant combinations and um, even we, the, our office was able to do an outing this year. We went to this really beautiful quaint garden up in um, Litchfield County called, um, sorry, the name is escaping me. Um, oh, well, it's just, just this explosion of plants and really gorgeous garden rooms. And it's just that kind of thing is what just keeps us going. Like the flowers, the plants, the textures, the color. And um, I'm fortunate that my, I get to keep doing that because outside is a great place to be right yeah. now. Um, for our office does a lot of these inspiration trips and inspiration funds, which is something I'm really missing right now where um, we do retreats where we go, you know, sometimes we go all over New England. Um, you know, we've been to the mansions in um, Newport. We've been to Greenwich, you know, we've been up to um, Gloucester and Ipswich. Um, but that's something really unique that we get to do. And recently um, we started doing kind of tours of Boston and beautiful architecture here in Boston, um, such as the Anthenaeum and um, just taking in what we have around us. Um, I mean, I love going to, you know, Europe and Paris and London and seeing like beautiful design, but we also have like beautiful design right around us. And I think that's something we're really trying to look at here in our office and you know, do as a team building thing. And also, you know, so we can all see it together um, and experience it and, ha and, and talk about our different experiences in those places. So uh, pre-COVID, that was something that we were doing on top of our kind of longer retreats. We were doing um, monthly kind of retreats to other different places throughout the city, which has been really amazing. 
That's great. And I think it's important right now too that we're, we, we do kind of stay close to home and there is amazing inspiration to be found right outside your door as Ellie, you were saying and, and Stephanie that your, your tours are around Boston. Well, we had a nice conversation right before we all went live about your first design memory. I think that would be a nice way to kind of close out um, uh, on a high note uh, tonight's program. So who wants to share their first design memory or, or the first time you realized that or I guess looking back at that, that was a design memory. Someone mentioned it at the okay. um, Oh, Emily, go ahead. Yeah, so my father was a design uh, a builder in New Hampshire and he also designed the buildings. And I used to sit at his drafting table when he was hand drafting. And so as a child, very young, seven, eight, nine, I was also drawing floor plans late at night, staying up late, designing floor plans. I just loved the way that they flow and kind of making it all work and so. It was very early that I was doing that. That's great. Well, I was obsessed with, and I'm still, I guess, um, with dolphins and whales and those marine life. Um, so I knew when I was little that when I grew up, I wanted a large aquarium in the middle of my living room that housed dolphins. And so I remember imagining how the house would lay out and like where my bedrooms would be. And so that was definitely one of my first <laughs> unrealistic design goals. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Anybody else want to share a design memory? I have one that um, I don't, I can't remember if I was in middle school or high school, but I was having a moment as teenagers do and my room was baby blue. And I just remember talking to my dad about, I am just not a baby blue type girl. And I needed to paint my room like blood red, like the darkest <laughs> red, the most impossible red to paint. And he let me paint my room to I listened to my CD, I think it was Nelly at the time and just painted the room red and really felt empowered by being able to change your space. Um, and so I don't know if my dad remembers that, but he's probably listening. <laughs> That's great, blood red. <laughs> That's hard Dark to remember. Red, I don't know, I don't know, yeah. I can't remember the color. <laughs> and I think mine was similar, I think I, it's in the interview is that um, my parents, you know, designed and built their home. My dad loved antiques and um, architecture. And we would go all around New England and see barns and go antiquing. Um, but my mom had basically like every Martha Stewart in country living under the sun. And I just loved looking through them and imagining like the houses I would have. And um, Christmas became like my way of decorating. And I would like, I saw these, you know, tablecloths that she had done with snowflakes on them. And I puff painted four different, you know, glittery <laughs> tablecloths for Christmas. And um, that was kind of a way that I was able to express myself. And my mom just always like went with it. My parents just always supported it um, from an early age. So um, that was kind of my, I think I just always knew I loved things that were home related, but I didn't really know what that meant. You know, yeah. Designing your world. Yeah, and you're, I'm sure you're encouraging that with your own children now then. <laughs> Excellent. Well, guys, I don't want to cut this too short, but we're at five o'clock and we had a couple of, of, of closing announcements we wanted to, to make um, about 540. This is this has been really wonderful hearing from all of you. It's been really wonderful for me getting to know you. We have a great section in the, in the current um, issue with the magazine. Um, but so be sure to check uh, out November, December um, issue of New England Home. We profile each of our winners. We also talk about their custom rug designs. Um, as, and as you know, um, part of that program, uh, part of the, the 540 program is that each of the designers, whether they're, they've ever designed a rug before, will design custom rug with the support of Landry and Arkari, which we auction off for charity. Um, this year, the auction is online, as Kathy mentioned earlier. And I believe it went live as of uh, 4 p.m. this afternoon. We added a chat in the chat box. There's a link um, to that online auction. And all of you who attended um, should have received that link as well with your confirmation email. The bidding is open through Friday, uh, November 13th. So check back often and bid generously. Um, this, this All proceeds uh, go to charity. 
So also next year, we're already looking ahead to 540 2021 and nominations are open. If you know someone you'd like to nominate or if you'd like to nominate yourself, the instructions are under the events tab on our website. And we also, I believe, just shared that in the chat panel. So there's a link directly to the nominations instructions um, on our website. And finally, Bragby has extended an invitation to all our attendees today to join us at the PRISM Awards presentation, which begins right now. Um, a link on how to attend was included in your confirmation email and we're sharing that as well. Um, it's, I think right now it's the, it's the, the kind of meet and greet, um, you get to talk with people. And I think that happens for an hour, Kathy, before the actual awards presentation begins. So you have time to like take a break from this Zoom and go over to that Zoom. <laughs> um, and so again, thanks for helping us celebrate this year's 540 winners. Um, if you'd like to contact any of them, you can contact me and I will put you in touch or anyone on the New England home team can help you because I think um, each one of these winners is, is uh, worth keeping track of. So uh, we look forward to raising a glass with all of you in person, hopefully next year. So thanks everybody. <laughs> it's 5.03. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Bye. everybody. Take care guys. <laughs>